Realm presents Bullet Catcher, Season 2, Episode 4. The Price of Conscience. When I wake, I'm alone. The altered dress hangs over the back of the vanity chair. The light coming through the slats tells me it's late morning. I rise onto my elbows, and the memory of the night before echoes through my aching body. Getting to my feet, I examine myself in the vanity mirror. My cheek is a dark splotch. Lifting my shirt, I wince at the band of purple around my ribs from when I was thrown down the stairs. Cass comes in, shutting the door quickly behind her. They found the body, she says. They're holding a quorum down in the saloon. And? So far, no one's come forward. Lobo is down there in case he has to steer attention away from you. I want to go. I don't think that's a good idea. I want to anyway. Cass examines my face, holding my chin in her hand. We'll have to do something about that bruise, she says. A short time later, Cass and I enter the saloon. I feel nearly hidden beneath the layers of makeup Cass has applied to the bruise on my face, and the new dress fits well enough. It hardly matters anyway because everyone in the packed room is focused on the men at the center, debating on what to do about the body. Cass and I edge around the side of the crowd until we reach the far end of the saloon. I vault onto the bar to better see. Cass takes a seat and orders a whiskey. Further down the bar, encircled by onlookers, a small group of men argue. On a table lies the body of the man I killed, covered in a white sheet, stained here and there with blood. Lobo stands among the men, smoking thoughtfully. It should be easy to find the culprit. One of the men, Purchase, announces. He wears a large cowboy hat, a dark blue vest, and well-trimmed side whiskers. Whoever did this left behind one vital piece of evidence. What could it be? I burned the wanted posters and left behind only blood and sweat. The man produces a knife. A blade stained with dry blood. Cass's knife. The one I took from her bag before leaving the room last night. The same knife I used to stab the man. My blood runs cold. The killer left this at the scene. The width of the blade matches the wound in the man's back, confirming the man is a coward as well as a fool. The man's initials, C.S., are engraved on the handle. He slams a knife onto the table beside the body. I watch Lobo, who only offers the smallest flinch when the man produces the knife, but still says nothing. He seems to have garnered respect from the other men, the same who were at the card table the night before, because no sooner has Purchase finished his speech than the others turn to Lobo, awaiting his reaction. Lobo draws on his cigarette and with a puff of smoke says, Well, Mr. Purchase, I suppose we better check the passenger list, then. The captain steps forward, the list already in hand. Purchase snatches the paper from him and unfurls it on the bar, tracing the names with his finger. We're in luck, he announces. There's only a single name that matches the initials. One Courtney Summer. That's impossible, comes a voice from the back of the room. I've never killed anyone in my life. The voice belongs to a youngish man, finely dressed in a button-up shirt, pressed trousers, and a derby. Purchase flicks his hand and two large men turn towards Courtney. The young man takes a hesitant step backwards, bumps into one of the tables, and startled, takes off for the door, overturning chairs on his way. He manages to get the doors open before Purchase's men intercept him, wresting him from the door handle and carrying him, punching and kicking, back into the circle. They deposit him on the ground in a heap. He quickly tries to stand, but Lobo comes over and pushes him back down. Best not, son, he says. They want blood. I just want to know why you did it, 
Purchase asks, making a show of the question for the audience. He obviously likes the attention. I... I didn't. Courtney winces. Purchase spits on the ground. You make me sick, he says. Boys, take him to the brig until we can figure out what to do with him. String him up, one of the gunslingers shouts. Tie him to the rail, says another. We'll use him for target practice. The captain clears his throat and speaks up. Mr. Purchase, we don't have a brig. Purchase turns an angry eye on the captain. Then lock him in his room. The trial won't take long. His henchmen try to pull Courtney to his feet, and when he resists, one of them grabs him by the front of his shirt and delivers a savage punch to his jaw. Courtney goes limp, and the henchman slings him easily over his shoulder and carries him out of the room, followed closely by the posse of gunslingers. The crowd closes in on Purchase, slapping him on the back and offering to buy him a drink. Lobo says something to him and excuses himself. He finds Cass and me in the crowd and signals to meet him outside. Lobo's waiting for us, resting his elbows on the rail, watching the rows of trees and fishing shanties pass along the shore. We must be far north, because I don't recognize the plants or trees. I hadn't noticed it this morning, but the air is cooler than yesterday, and the sun overhead shines dimly through the low, dark clouds cast about the sky like splotches of gray-black paint. When we sidle up beside him, he says, It seems we're in the clear. Cass nods and says in a low voice, Why didn't you say you'd taken the knife, Emma? I guess I forgot. But what about that Courtney guy? Lobo shrugs as if to say, Better him than us. They're going to kill him for something I did. They're going to kill him for something the man who tried to rape you did. Lobo says. What's the difference? The difference is that it's not your fault, cub. It will be if we don't stop it. There's no way to prove the man's innocence without exposing yourself, cub. Consider it a blessing. We'll arrive in Gildan tonight. All we have to do is keep our mouths shut, and we're one step closer to saving Nico. The trial is held out on the main deck, in twilight. Oil lamps hang like party lights from the railings. The captain, along with Purchase, Lobo, and the rest of the rich card players, holds court at the stern. The passengers gather on lounge chairs and around tables that have been dragged from the saloon onto the deck. I stand on the steps leading up to the top deck, watching the proceedings below. Cass sits on the step beside me, half interested. The captain bangs the rail with a wrench, and the buzz of the crowd fades to silence. We are here to carry out the sentence of one Courtney Summer, who has been found guilty of the crime of murder. When the captain speaks that word, murder, Courtney struggles against his bindings, desperately trying to speak around the gag in his mouth. Those who came prepared start pelting him with tomatoes and eggs and other things lifted from the kitchen. The captain bangs the rail until it stops, and the crowd falls silent again. What about a fair trial? I shout. Instantly, Cass's hand is wrapped around my arm, trying to pull me down, out of sight. But now, all eyes are on me, sizing me up like I just uttered some sin in the middle of a church. Purchase steps forward and says, He was tried privately, in his quarters, to avoid the circus of a trial. Cass pulls me down before I can say anything else, and the crowd swivels back to the stern. The captain clears his throat and goes on. Courtney Summer, you are guilty of the crime of murder, and as such, you will be put to death by keel hauling. Two of the captain's officers drag Courtney forward. He's bound at the ankles by a rope that ends in a long coil to one side. The two officers fix the other end of the rope to the man's wrists and cinch it tight before leading him over to the side of the rail. Wait, I shout, managing to wriggle free from Cass. Courtney hangs half over the rail, leveraged by the two officers, ready to dump him overboard. Cass leaps to her feet and growls into my ear. 
you risk Nico's life with this. But I know what she really means. She means I'm risking our lives. It wasn't Courtney, I shout. I killed the man in the engine room. There's a moment of silence as my words drift through the crowd. And then Purchase steps forward, pushing people out of his way, an amused smile on his face. My dear, I don't know what's come over you, whether you've had a tryst with this young miscreant, or if you're just smitten by the idea of an outlaw. But take my advice. Life is not like one of your romantic novels. Purchase is lucky he's not within punching distance, because by the time he's finished, my fists are balled so tight I feel like they might pop. He gives a sign to his men, and they tip Courtney over the rail and let him go. He disappears over the side and splashes into the water. A line of volunteers begins pulling on the rope from the other side of the boat, yanking Courtney through the water, beneath the hull. Sit down, Emma, Cass growls. Courtney emerges on the far side of the boat, and the spectators rush to the rail to catch a glimpse of him. They cry with excitement. Some try to pelt him with rotten fruit. And then they start pulling the rope in the opposite direction, the crowd rushing from one side of the boat to the other to catch him as he surfaces again. I pull free from Cass and leap off the side of the balustrade. I roll and pop to my feet, stealing the gun from the holster of one of the rich cowboys in the crowd. The gun is huge in my hand, polished to within an inch of its life. An accessory rather than a weapon. But as long as it shoots, it'll do. Rising to my feet, I grip the gun in both hands to steady my aim and extend it out in front of me. Down! The crowd hits the deck. The gun nearly kicks out of my hands. The report is deafening. But my aim is true, and the bullet tears through the rope, sending the men pulling it sprawling to the ground. Above me, Cass curses loudly. A contingent of the gunslingers come charging down the stairs, and she feigns moving to one side to let them pass before sticking out her boot and sending them clattering to the bottom of the stairs. Lobo springs into action, his persona falling away like a discarded cape. He runs for the rope, kicks away the men still holding tight to it, and begins dragging Courtney from the water. Now that our cover's blown, I guess he figures he might as well save the man. Banishing the pistol into the water, I run to help him, weaving through the crowd, getting to their feet. I reach Lobo, take the rope in my hands, and begin hauling. Courtney emerges over the railing, soaking wet, blood gushing from a gash in his head. His eyes are half-closed and stunned. When he appears over the railing, I get to him, pull the gag from his mouth, and begin working on the knots binding his wrists. Don't worry. You're okay. Two loud bangs interrupt my work, and again the crowd scatters, making for the cover of the deck below. Through the scrum of faces I see Purchase, his gun raised skyward, smoke wafting from the barrel. Stop right there, he says, lowering the gun at me. Lobo steps between us. His hands are at his sides, fingers slightly outstretched, twitching with potential energy. I'd put down the piece if I were you, he says coolly. I should have smelled the stink of an outlaw on you, old timer, Purchase sneers. With a face like yours, what else could you be? I see Purchase's men too late. They come charging at us from out of the evacuating crowd, one at me, one at Lobo. The first of them reaches out to grab me, and I get low to slip away, but his knee catches me square in the chest, scattering me to the ground and knocking the air from my lungs. Lobo deftly steps out of the way, but gets tangled in Courtney's rope, and he, Purchase's man, and Courtney end up in a ball on the deck, the heavy man trying to get his hands around Lobo's throat, and Courtney completely nonsensical and nearly unconscious. Purchase tracks Lobo with the end of his pistol before squeezing the trigger. His first shot finds a home in his own man's back. Blood slashes across the deck. He cries in pain, but he seems spurred on by the gunshot, like a horse whipped into a frenzy by its rider. Purchase aims again and fires. Cass is running full bore across the deck, dodging around spilled tables and leaping over fallen passengers. She dives and intercepts the bullet, using her palm to deflect it, before finishing in a roll and popping to one knee ready for the next shot. The shooter's eyes go big, 
I can read the words on his lips before I hear the sound. Bullet catchers? The gunslingers, back on their feet, gaze at us with hatred. And then comes the scrape of iron on leather as they draw their guns. Nothing is said. No questions asked. They just start shooting. My lungs burn as I force them to take an air. But no sooner am I back on my feet than Purchase's man grabs me and tries to haul me over the side of the boat. I stick out my feet, plant them on the rail, and throw my head back, smashing the man's nose. He drops me. I turn and punch him in the crotch, spin behind him, grab his coat, and pull him over the rail, watching as he tumbles past one of the lifeboats and disappears into the slate gray water below. Lobo's entangled himself from the scrum. His attacker lies sprawled on deck, half-consciously pawing at the blood pooling around his body. Lobo and I lock eyes, and he helps me pull Courtney to his feet, bring him to the rail, and lower him overboard, where he lands with a thud in the bottom of the lifeboat. When we turn, we find that the gunslingers have formed a firing line. With their guns held up before them, they march slowly towards us. Purchase joins the end of the line, his face painted with a grin made mad by bloodlust. Cass stands between us and them, her hands at her sides, ready for the firefight. We join her, stand side to side to side. Purchase is the first to shoot, aiming from the hip. His shot goes wide of Lobo, who catches it and hurls it back toward the line, hitting one of the gunslingers square in the chest. He falls with a thud. The commander yells, Cease fire! Cease fire, goddammit! Then everyone is shooting, drowning out his words. The bullets ring past us, stinging my clothes and skin. They deflect in a thousand different directions, but the salvos are too constant for us to do much else than deflect them. I cut the air with my palm, sending a bullet tumbling away. An oil lamp strung up to light the trial explodes in a burst of liquid fire, scattering across the deck. It spreads quickly, finding and bursting more lamps, and within seconds the whole boat is aflame. Some of the crew and passengers try to smother the fire with rugs and water, but it's useless. The fire arches high, casting an orange flame on the gunslinger's shooters. The fire spreads. The boat groans. And there's Purchase at the corner of my vision, delighting in the destruction. People like him are all the same. They talk about law and order, but all they really want is to watch the world burn. I feel the anger bubbling up inside me, running from my chest, down my arm, and into my hand. I grab a bullet from the air, feeling its heat, feeling it burrow into my skin because the anger makes my form sloppy. But I don't care, because the anger makes me powerful. I throw the bullet at Purchase, and it hits him in the gut, staggering him backward. His smile fades as he looks down at the circle of blood spreading across his fine shirt. The gun slips from his hand. He touches his finger to the blood, a look of disbelief in his eyes. And then his knees buckle, and he falls flat on his back. Then the familiar sting of bullets buzzing my skin. All I feel is a burning across my cheek, and my arm and ribs, sharp like touching a hot skillet. And the next thing I know, I'm on the ground. And when I try to stand, my hands are slick with blood running down my arms. Pulling myself up by the rail, I can see the bright lights of Gildan come into view. Then the flames reach the engine room, and an explosion rocks the deck, spilling everyone to the ground. Above me, the smokestack explodes into a fireball. The boat lurches, the far side rising up out of the water, casting passengers and gunslingers into the frigid water below. I'm thrown against the railing, just managing to dodge the falling deck chairs and bodies. No one's fighting anymore. They're looking for an escape from the sinking hulk. Passengers and crew furiously cut at the ropes tethering the lifeboats to the side of the ship. They pile into the smaller vessels, crowding in at the bottoms before turning to kick away the other panicked passengers trying to clamber aboard. I watch an officer dump a woman overboard with the swipe of an oar. A lady in a soiled derby hat and ruined dress buries her heel into the side of an older man, hanging onto the side of the lifeboat. 
he plunges into the dark water and disappears. The metal clang of a bullet ricocheting off the iron rail beside me snaps me to my senses. My whole body burns in pain, and I'm covered in blood. The deck is nearly vertical. Above me, hanging from the rail at the other side of the boat, a gunslinger aims his shooter at me, fighting the staggering and rocking of the sinking boat to get a good shot. Propping myself against the rail, I try to find a position where I might catch the bullet. Then the gunslinger finds his spot and pulls the trigger. My arms feel heavy, but I manage to pull them into the shape of a circle, intercepting the bullet as it flies past. The energy makes my skin tingle as its flight bends, skimming the circumference of my arms before I break the ring and let the bullet fly. It nips the end of my finger as I guide it back to where it came. At the far rail, the gunslinger lets out a short grunt as the bullet pierces his side. His grip slackens and he tumbles down the deck. I don't have time to move out of the way and he barrels straight into me. The force tears the rail free and we hurtle off the side of the boat. The world turns end over end. The boat, the water, the fire, the moonlit sky. My fall ends with a thud at the bottom of a lifeboat. Pain rings through my body as I hit the side and cling for dear life. The gunslinger's body tumbles past me into the water below. Up above, the remaining passengers gather at the lip of the far side of the boat and wait and hope that rescue comes before the whole thing slips below the water. Cass and Lobo are nowhere to be seen. A groan draws my attention to my lifeboat. Courtney lies at the bottom of the lifeboat between the seat planks. Suddenly, we lurch back towards the hull of the northward bound. The ropes are still attached, and any moment they're going to force our small boat under the water. Adrenaline enlivens my bloodless body, and I pick myself up and search for anything that I might use to cut us free. Courtney groans again, drawing my attention back to him. Quickly searching his pockets, I find a buck knife, flip it open, and begin sawing the ropes. I work furiously, but the blade is uncared for and dull. Finally, the first rope snaps, and the front end of the lifeboat pops back out of the water, and I go to work on the second. The water reaches my ankles, then my knees, then my waist. The cold locks up my joints. I can't breathe. The blade slips from my hand and disappears into the water gathering at the bottom of the boat. The world spins as I feel along the bottom, searching for it. Then there's another pair of hands combing through the water, and at first I think I'm imagining it. But when I look up, there's Courtney, his face stained with blood from his head wound and screwed into a look of concentration. His eyes go wide, and he pulls the blade from the water. I hold as tight as I can to the side of the boat as he gets to his feet and begins working again at the rope. Then... Just as it seems we're going to get dragged under, the rope pops and the lifeboat lurches free. Courtney collapses beside me, chest heaving, and we watch in silence as the northward bound slips halfway below the water, its bow sticking straight up into the sky. Scattered debris and a few people float on the surface around the vessel. From Gildan, smaller craft begin to converge on the spot. They glide past us toward the disaster. We are floating to shore, where the bright lights of the city burn. It starts to snow. The flakes land on my skin before melting and dripping into the water at the bottom of the boat. You're listening to Bullet Catcher Season 2 by Joaquin Lowe. Produced by Realm your portal to another world. Listen away. Bullet Catcher is written by Joaquin Lowe, produced by Marco Palmieri, and executive produced by Molly Barton, performed by Inez del Castillo. Audio produced, directed, and designed by Amanda Rose Smith. Additional editing by Corey Barton. Original theme composed by Hashem Asadolahi, with performances by Justin Morell and Josh Deutsch. 
Cover art by Christine Barcelona. <laughs>